we'll, we can expand that as we get to the model and start doing various modifications to it. Now, Thank you, Mr. Teal. I'd like to welcome Representative Sadler and Representative Knopp. Yeah, Senator, anytime. Von Im Senator Von Imhoff. Go ahead. Thank you, through the chair, Mr. Teal. Um, I was, I'm looking on the far right-hand side there on the dividend check, and you have the red um, with the red squares versus the blue line. So one of the questions that I have for you is the status quo. I am assuming at this point it includes having the $10 billion in the earnings reserve account along with the 45 or so billion in the corpus uh, being invested uh, in the same way as it is now. In the event that Senate Bill 26 does not pass, and through a majority vote, we begin as a legislature to take money from the ERA. The Permanent Fund Corporation may make different decisions in how they invest the ERA. And a full quarter of the fund will be invested uh, prudently to manage cash flow, meaning uh, lower risks. And we will not probably see its full investment value a quarter of it, about $10 billion in the ERA, if this doesn't pass and draws on the ERA similar to the CBR, begins. Because you cannot manage cash flow and be in these uh, investments that lock up the cash for many years. So this worries me because that red line does have a risk of dropping pretty significantly if a quarter of the fund is no longer invested in the exact same way that it is now, but is invested in much lower returns. If you'd like to comment on that, please. And through the chair, Senator, I think you're being very mild in your assessment. Um, that line, status quo, assumes that we can continue to pay dividends if you don't pass SB 26. But if you look at what happens if you didn't pass 26, you would not have this 1.8 and growing billion dollars going to the general fund. Those deficits would then be filled from the CBR. The CBR would be gone in FY19. Once the CBR is gone, you either have to cut government by 50% immediately, or you're going to begin using money from the earnings reserve account. If you start drawing one point, well, it's not 1.8, it's more like $2.5 billion from the earnings reserve account to fill your deficit, the earnings reserve account is depleted rapidly and you wouldn't have dividends. But again, as I said at the beginning, <coughs> I, I don't know that we want to get into a, a discussion of well, what would happen if we didn't do, you know, what would, what would the status quo or the business as usual scenario be? Because it simply doesn't work. You, you don't have the cash to not begin a structured draw from the earnings reserve account as SB 26 does. So to me, it goes way beyond the impact of simply lowering your returns. It, that status quo dividend uh, that's showing large dividends simply can't happen. There won't be money to continue that. Thank you, Senator Van Imhoff. Senator Machicki. <coughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. That was one of my problems with this particular model. I mean, I, and I understand the purpose of the model. I use it every day. I think it's uh, the best case we have for sort of laying everything out on a dashboard, but it, that's an excellent point. The fact is the other plot we have with a status quo, if you use the same burn rate, had us running out of money for a dividend by around 26. Um, and that's part of this plan is hoping for a dividend in perpetuity. But that's not the point I wanted to wait, make, Madam Chair. I, 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 the reason for today's meeting was to demonstrate that the Senate plan works. 
And we have a baseline um, graph up there with assumptions, but I do have to bring up the fact that <clears throat> On 421, the Department of Revenue presented our 12% decline from 523,000 to 459,000 barrels a day, even though for the first time in 14 years, we have um, two years of an increase. And for the first time, I think in 30, for the first time in 14 years, we had an annual increase in production. For the first time in 30 years, we had increases two years in a row. And I just wanted to point out that that P10 still demonstrates a 9% decline from 523 to 475. So this is an extremely conservative for those that think we may be pushing the edge to get numbers we want, that's not the case. That's still an extremely conservative assumption on likely production um, in the next few years going out. So um, in case people thought we were on the edge, I think it's really important that they understand that there are many layers of conservatism designed into this chart. Thank you, Senator Machicki. Mr. Teal, if we could continue. Uh, so the, uh, those at home can understand how we are trying to measure any, um, any proposal going forward. We are trying to ensure that the permanent fund itself, the corpus of the permanent fund is protected. And in the baseline model, it actually performs better than the status quo. Is that accurate, Mr. Teal? It is, Madam Chair. And that does assume a percent of market draw at 5%, 5.25 uh, the first few years, and 5% uh, dropping down. Is that accurate? That's correct. And for my colleague who's not here, Senator Hoffman and I had an opportunity to meet with the governor and talk about the Senate's plan. Uh, the governor, uh, the executive branch, originally stated to all Alaskans that we should be concerned and want to uh, look at a manageable draw from our earnings to protect the people's dividend, to make sure that the people of Alaska were not hopeful but ensured that in perpetuity a dividend could go forward. I, I remain uh, supportive of that statement, but the administration has changed those goals somewhat in the last few days. In the last 12 days, they, they've actually modified uh, sort of the must-haves from the people of Alaska, and those must-have include a major oil and gas tax reform so that uh, one industry, not all industries pay more, but one industry pays more, as well as uh, the people of Alaska need to be tied to the services that they're receiving. and begin to pay from their pocket to government's purse uh, a percentage of their income uh, to support uh, the current size of government. And I would just interject as one, uh, one senator that that is not my intent uh, to moving forward a conversation on SB 26. My intent is to protect the dividend itself. And I know folks can argue about that, but when you just look at the quadrant on the dividend check and you look at the loss to the people of Alaska, I think Mr. Thiel and Senator Von Imhoff point out that those are optimistic projections that don't face or don't reflect the actual challenge that um, both the House and the Senate are facing in trying to meet payroll of the current size of state government. And in an effort to meet payroll and, in fact, from the Senate side, reduce payroll, specifically uh, payroll that, that uh, it's, it's difficult to accomplish without an administration who's supportive. And, in fact, Mr. Thiel, when we talk about FY19, uh, that seems a, a long ways off when you're sitting in a calendar year 17. But, in fact, FY19 is next year for this legislative body. Is that correct for planning purposes? That's correct. You're currently working on the FY18 budget. And Mr. Teal, FY18's budget begins when? July 1st. Of this year. So I, it, it can be confusing. Uh, and, and our school districts actually operate on a even different schedule uh, where they're uh, actually budgeting uh, a different way than the state budget. So ours is a fiscal year. And I believe that the um, municipality school districts are operating on a state year. So some of our numbers can get very uh, 
confusing, and we, have to, we need to be very specific on those numbers as, as we move forward. Mr. Teal, could you please proceed? Thank you. Um, just a comment on Senator Machiki's choice of assumptions. Um, are they conservative? Are they, well, they're certainly not designed to make things look good. We think they're reasonable. We also lean towards the conservative because I, it's, it's the old adage, you hope for the best but plan for the worst. And if, if you're doing, making plans based on assumptions that you don't have a reasonable expectation of reaching, you're fooling yourself. So I would, would probably say that, that the assumptions that, that go into the baseline may be a bit conservative. And I believe that we can justify them being conservative because it's so much easier to be wrong, uh, you know, on, it's a, it's a whole lot better to have your error be, we've got more money in an easier time than we thought we were going to have than to have things turn out worse than you planned for. So we do use fairly conservative assumptions. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I appreciate the fact that the P10 value is conservative, but I am concerned about the permanent fund investment return rate at 6.95. <clears throat> that, that seems um, on the high end to me to be, you know, for that number to be used. Can you speak to <coughs> Speak to that. What happens if the return is not up at that rate? Uh, Senator Hughes, through the chair, that's why we use assumptions from the permanent fund. They, they pay the consultants. They have the knowledge to project. They've modified their projections slightly over the years. They used to be at 8%. They've generally met their investment targets. So. Uh, we look at it as uh, we've talked to Angela Rodell the, 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 of the Permanent Fund who has testified before the legislature that she believes the 6.95 is achievable and we're not about to argue with her. Uh, I hope it comes in higher than that. You may know that the retirement boards will have a target of 8%. So 6.95 uh, with very long-term investments. Um, I wouldn't say aggressive investment, but I'd say well-balanced portfolio, 6.95 seems achievable. Thank you. Senator Hughes? Yeah, thank you. And I've heard her, I didn't hear her speak at this table, but I've heard her speak elsewhere that she was 5% even made her a little uncomfortable. So I, I, I mean, I do hope that it is higher. That's what we want and, and hope for. But I just I um, can see that the P10 value is conservative, but I, that 6.95 just seems a little high to me. Thank you. <coughs> Senator Machicki. We think, uh, so I, we, we've spent a lot of time at this table, not only with uh, the um, Alaska Permanent Fund Corporation, but with uh, independent evaluation from Callan and others. Um, so 6.95 is the earnings expectation, which essentially our entire national um, investment climate would crash much below. That's um, an expected return rate. The draw rate is, I think, what you're talking about on the five and a quarter down to five. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I, I, so just to be clear, we've had um, many hours at this table with the experts um, testifying that 6.95 um, is the expected return as with any sort of sovereign investment fund. Um, and I don't know if you want to comment on that or not. I think it's important for people to realize that that is a appropriate, um, relatively conservative number. Senator Machicki, if I might. Um, the Permanent Fund Corporation, when we had those presentations, has a portfolio that's balanced differently than stock market. And so they have a core base that is real estate. 
that is uh, seeing gains differently than the stock market, even though right now the stock market is, um, is moving forward and upward under the new administration. So uh, the 6.9 is reasonable, and so is the 5 and the 5 and a quarter draw. Ms. Rodell was in front of this body at this table and said both are reasonable, I think I'm using the correct terminology, reasonable assumptions for the state and the actuaries from the administration backed up the calculations that are included in SB 26 um, in the runs that they do from Callan to assure us that the models and the stress points um, are reasonable in all of our assumptions. We certainly could lower the percent of market value payout, which is why we started a 5.25 and dropped down to a 5% rate. And we have a review inside the legislation at the three-year marker to again confirm with both Callan or some other actuary that those assumptions are accurate and that we are not stressing the actual permanent fund itself or our savings accounts uh, by those draws. Mr. Teal, did you have additional uh, comments for consideration for the public and for the legislature? I do. I think that any time we show model output or use a model for any purposes, you have to, we have to say a few words of caution. These are projections. The future is uncertain, and we're not pretending we, we know the future. Um, we expect you to understand that your policy decisions have to address that uncertainty. You can't get away from the fact that the future is uncertain. The base scenario uses stable earnings projection 6.95. It uses mid-level revenue from oil. Um, that's pretty stable too, despite the fact that we, we know or pretty much know that both earnings and oil prices will be volatile. We, we can't really build that in, so keep a few things in mind. The precision of this model is not high. It's, it's, when we look at these numbers, you look at these numbers, you should be looking at trends, not at the numbers themselves. So we think we're within a couple hundred million dollars. Now, to some people that may sound like, well, what good is a model that's got a margin of error of a couple hundred million dollars? Um, it is useful. It, it's, it's the best we can do, and if you want to see what happens with different assumptions, it's very easy to change those assumptions. So that's up to you to see how well a model survives uh, with different assumptions. Uh, just to give you an idea of the, the, the variability in these projections, and I'm going to turn it over to Alexi because I can't remember the exact numbers here, but look at the numbers, the, the projections for <laughs> FY18 revenue, which were at one time $7 billion or so. Uh, for the record, Alexi Painter, Legislative Finance. So the, the lowest forecast of FY18 was the spring of 2016 forecast, and that was something like 500 million lower than this current forecast. And the highest was when made when oil was $120 or so, projected something like $7 billion of revenue for FY18. So when we say plus or minus a few hundred million, it, over the long term, it may be plus or minus you know, five billion, but probably not minus five billion. Thank you, Mr. Teal. So, uh, Mr. Teal, in this base model, uh, we have an assumption of a, a hundred and eighty million dollar capital budget for undesignated general fund. Can do you recall what last year, Mr. Carpenter? Do you do you re recall last year's capital budget? What the size of UGF spending was? It was ninety six million dollars last year, Madam Chair, and it probably will be less than 100 million this year. The 180 was a long term, and we can certainly modify that assumption when we get to an active model. Mr. Teal, the only reason I raise that is that I just wanted those that are watching to understand that we have tried to put in this scenario to stress it a bit, a larger capital budget than was presented last year and a larger one that's being proposed this year than this year. Mr. Teal, please continue. And 
last word of caution on models is you should always stress test them um, by using less favorable assumptions regarding earnings, oil, uh, so on, and, and we can do that here when we get the model up live. But the, the takeaways from this base case, and I, I don't know if I can increase the size of this or not. Apparently not. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but in this quadrant, the lower quadrant, there are some numbers under the graph. And the, uh, we talked a little bit about the permanent fund being, the, its value is protected, the dividends being fairly flat. But what you see in, in this quadrant is that in FY18, about three quarters of the projected $2.5 billion deficit are filled under the baseline assumptions, leaving a deficit of about $600 million. And those deficits decline in the future so that you're filling 86 percent um, before relying on the CBR in FY26. And again, remember precision. Don't, 86 is not a percentage we're willing to, to stake our lives on. It's just a trend. The trend is improving. You're filling about three quarters of the deficit immediately and more of the deficit as time goes on. Um, the CBR is not empty in FY19 as implied by slide three. Um, that, that's a critical thing. Um, under slide three, you're completely out of time. With SB26, the, SB, the CBR, although it's declining, lasts a number of years, and the chart at the bottom of the screen shows the deficit. It also shows the years to exhaust that deficit. And that the years to exhaust are increasing, the deficit is, is decreasing. So uh, I think we should just switch to the model at this point and, and I know, but. Senator Meyer, did you have a? Well, that, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And Madam Chair, being an alumni of this committee uh, a couple years ago, I, uh, I'm not quite as current as some of the members, but it just seems like to me, uh, again, under the um, dashboard here, the CBR earnings, you have it at 2.89%. <coughs> and if I recall, the CBR was invested some aggressively, some not so aggressively. Is, it just seems like 2.89 is pretty low. Uh, and that my question would be, Madam Chair, is how, how did we get that number? Is that based on historical um, returns for the CBR? Senator Meyer, through the chair. Um, the CBR doesn't earn much because, as Senator von Imhoff discussed briefly, your returns are, are correlated with your investment strategy. When you have little money in your CBR, and demands, potential demands, on using that money, you cannot invest it long term. You're essentially holding it as cash or cash equivalents, and you, you just don't get a 7% return unless you can have a portfolio designed to, to generate 7%. Senator Meyer, uh, the Revenue Commissioner uh, made the decision because there could be uh, a required uh, call on cash to liquidate most of the uh, CBR and that has proved to be wise as far as liquidity goes to be able to manage state government but that is uh, one of the contributing factors the liquidity for cash flow for government that uh, the earnings rate went down in the CBR okay thank you madam chair that makes sense and then just one other quick question on the inflation itself, that some speculate inflation is going to go up considerably in the near term future with the new uh, president and the uh, stimulus to the uh, economy in the lower 48. Um, look at the screen. How would that impact things if the inflation rate does go, say, 5%? Mm -hmm. 
Through the chair, Senator Meyer, we can change those assumptions. Uh, Alexi is just switching over to the model itself. We can't, we couldn't do anything on the screen with a PDF, but you're now able to make changes. The last slide, we can just skip all that showed was the, the Senate budget, which is a reduction of about $185 million from the governor's budget. So uh, if you start saying, let's, what if this and what if that, I think it's best to just go to the slides and, and we can put in different inflation rates, different capital budgets, different cut scenarios, different revenue measures. Um, basically, wherever you want to go with this, we can stress test with higher, with sorry, lower oil prices, lower returns, um, just so you can see what happens and, and make sure that you're satisfied that SB 26 can hold up under some difficult fiscal assumptions and that it, under the baseline assumptions, under stress testing, means that if nothing else you have a lot of you have some more time before you have to do uh, before you have to consider revenue measures that does not guarantee that you won't be back here in a few years discussing revenue measures because we can't guarantee no one can guarantee that that the assumptions that we're using are not going to be very optimistic even though we're being conservative in setting them now, the future is uncertain. So with that, I'll just turn it over to Alexis so he can change the model <coughs> as you wish. M Madam Chair, uh, you don't need to do that on my uh, a, a account, but I was just wondering, how, how did you get to the 2.25% inflation factor? Through the chair, Senator Meyer, 2.25 is the assumption that the permanent fund uses. Good enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Teal. So where I thought we might start is the <coughs> Senate recommendations actually for uh, cuts in this year's budget. And I believe those were around $185 million. So if we entered uh, that in, uh, we can try a variety of scenarios to uh, test the model to see uh, what is happening and whether our reserves are growing, uh, whether the uh, corpus of the permanent fund is protected or adversely or positively affected by some of the changes. So the first variable would be the $185 million worth of cuts. Is that in there now? And so you see a slight uptick in the uh, reserves, and that is with one year's worth of cuts, not with any 